G'day. Welcome to episode number two of the Cold Blood Contributions podcast, which is part of the Marillia Python Radio Network. We are host drivers. I'm Scott Iper, and with me is my wife, Ty. This podcast will be bringing to you people in the hobby that have made an impact on us creatively, be it artistically, with data or improving husbandry out there. With us, Chris and Adeline Billmeyer. Uh, how are you guys? Good. Happy yeah. to be here. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. We're, we're really, really excited. Thank you so much for being our first guest. We're really excited as well. I'm a wildlife artist that specializes in reptiles and amphibians. And so that is my, my favorite thing. So I'm lucky and honored to be able to show and draw all kinds of critters and check out different places and go herping. And that's what we do full time. Jealous. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we had that opportunity. It would just be awesome. <laughs> Maybe not the drawing, Scott. I can't draw too well. Yeah, you've, got all the cool, you've got all the cool stuff out by you, too. It's funny, though. The you, stuff. Yeah, but you sort of take it for granted, I guess. Like, you're that used to seeing it. Like, when you pop up something new that's obviously, you know, av- not available here, we're both like, oh, my God, look at that. And, mm-hmm. you know, like the tiger snake, we were like, that's so cool. But we see it all the time. And I guess mm-hmm. we see a different perspective of it. Oh, for sure. Well, yeah, to us, everything you have over there, you know, to Australia yeah. is this mad place full of amazing creatures that, you know, Here we... I would love to see someday. But yeah, it's definitely, definitely easy to figure out the animals that you see all the time that are pretty commonly kept. Um, there's a group I'm in of uh, equestrians that, that are also into reptiles. And this one girl, she, uh, South Africa, she messaged me and she's like, you don't know how lucky you are. You are. You have salamanders. That's a huge deal. Yep. <laughs> it was just something I never thought about that before. I was geeking about salamanders when I'm geeking about mambas or, you know, whatever she's got. Definitely. 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 For sure. Um, I mean, we don't have salamanders here either. There's no there's no native yeah. chordates here in Australia. Um, we've got... I didn't know that. We've got intro- yeah. we've got an introduced species from Europe that turns up occasionally that they're trying to uh, extract or uh, mm-hmm. get rid of, but um, it's it's not happening too well at the moment. And I think the funding for that's actually stopped. So um, yeah, so you know we get you know I was pretty excited when we were in Europe a couple of years back and you know flipping over logs and turning up newts and stuff like that, which was pretty cool. So yeah, yeah they're fun. I never yeah, thought I'd see them get. I found like a tiger salamander that was like 10 inches long. Yeah, the there's some big guys up here. At the time, I was like, oh, that's a big tiger salamander. I didn't really think anything <laughs> of it. And I picked him up because he was in like a garage door, like little nook. And I took him and put him in. And now I think about him like, you know, that's a lot of people's lifer, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Mine's an Eastern Diamondback. And so many Americans are like, what? <laughs> They're so cool. They're crazy cool. I'd love to be able to see them in C2. There was one that I went and helped with uh, for a removal. And so I got to hang out with that one, but I'd like to actually go out in the field and find one on my own. That's, that's one of my goals. We're hoping to come over in 26. So, like, let's go hang out. and <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so you have to come Let me up. know so can you get your dates. Oh, yeah. yeah, that would be so for sure. Money and time—that's the—that's the shit thing. They never seem to align. <laughs> you either have money or you have time, and never both. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. How did how did you guys get into the hobby? I have always kept reptiles, so I'm very very thankful in the art that I had. The household I grew up in, full of all kinds of creatures. So I put them. I didn't really officially get into the hobby until later. I started working at an equine store when I was 18 and then slowly started getting more and more into reptiles because of their ease of care. And I was just really into them. I enjoyed them. And I, uh, I started working at a wildlife center that had a really, really cool collection of exotic reptiles and local wildlife and um, kind of just started collecting and collecting and collecting and collecting. <laughs> That's it. You can't just have one, can you? It's it's not like a dog or a cat where, you, okay, the couple will do you. It's like, oh, I wonder yeah. how this one works and what, it, you know, yeah. Oh, for sure. There's there's so much variety. It's so hard hard to say uh, 
no to to trying something new out you know new species uh, something from the desert or something tropical there's just there's so many options out there and there's so many last ones okay no more for a while babe i promise this is my last one. Oh no it followed me home <laughs> for sure for sure, well, for sure. yeah for sure and both being into reptiles, it's harder too because there's no one to really say no. You sort of go, oh, okay, because you're both keen on, on keeping and observing and whatnot. So, oh, for yeah, sure. I think sometimes but, it's harder than the couples where the wife or the husband isn't into reptiles and they're like, no, you've got enough, mm-hmm. no more. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're enablers, both of us. Yeah. So <laughs> when, we, when we first got together, I, I've always been a monitor person. I used to, to breed Ackies and... I had a bunch of different monitors, but well, she wanted to get crocs. I'm like, where are we going to put a croc? Well, I was like, thinking truthfully, we need to have a whole room and not have to build a basement, like giant <laughs> enclosure. I'm not going to put this thing in a little six by six box, you know? And then it's like, well, what about tree monitors? And it's like, okay. I love tree monitors. <laughs> so he's like, yeah, let's get some tree monitors. And so we get a pair. Let's get a little tree monitor. A little, little tiny guy there. And next thing that we know, we've got a whole a whole gaggle of tree monitors, and yeah, we, we both encourage each other. <laughs> They're like but Pringles; species... you can't stop at one. <laughs> exactly. So, what species of tree monitor are you working with? Have you got Bakari or uh, Prasinus yes. or Macrae? So, or... we've Bakari and Macrae now. We previously yeah. had Cordensis, and we had Prasinus too. But when we moved, yep. we moved into sort of a smaller space. And that's when I started really hitting a lot of shows. So I ended up downsizing the collection, which was pretty tough. It was pretty tough to do, but I I wanted to at least dedicate more time to the animals had rather than just maintenancing them. Yeah. And uh, yeah. with being gone a lot, it was just really hard. So thankfully, we've got a lot of a lot of connections and a lot of friends that ended up taking quite a few of the animals. So we still get like updates. We know that they're they're well taken care of. But yeah, downsizing those guys was pretty tough because that was like my goal was to have at least a trio of, um, you know, the whole Prasinus complex. So yep. maybe someday, but yep. my goal right now is more to be able to see everything in the wild rather than to keep stuff at home. So I do have the pair of Bakari, the pair of Macrii, and then I do, we breed um, Rhychodactylus auriculatus, the little gargoyles. So we've got yep. like striped gargs that we breed. Cool. What's the cool. phrase? Keep less and keep better. Yeah, that's get more, better. get more out yeah. of it. So yeah, and I think yeah. too, it's, it's because, nice to actually. Have one. Yeah, yeah, and I think too because it it's not like a dog. Or, well, here we have regulations with dogs. For example, you can only have so many per yard. Oh, the the yard size. Well, it is in Queensland. Um, it's. The, re- the regulations here around reptiles are a lot, I guess, looser. You can have a lot more as long as you can provide the adequate care and whatnot. So there is no real stopping you sort of thing. It's it's very easy yeah. to get another one and another one and another one. And, yeah, and then all of a sudden you've got a whole room full and you're like, shit, I don't have a weekend or spare time. Or... <laughs> yeah. Or a, um... yeah. At that point, I was just struggling to just maintenance them and that was it. I didn't get to enjoy them anymore. I was just working. Yeah. I saw an interesting way of actually keeping that complex um, where people were using uh, three-foot shower bases and then putting a shower screen, a set of shower enclosure mm-hmm. on top of it, and then just having like this seven-foot high enclosure made out of a shower effectively and just had rows of those set up and then the animals could then sort of thermoregulate and light regulate from depending on how close they were to the from the top of the enclosure to the bottom of the enclosure. And you could put these sized plants in and all the rest of it because it's got a fiberglass base on it with a drain and all the rest of it. You just have that all mm-hmm. plumbed into a, a system and you can have, set up your rain systems and all the rest of it and work really, really well for, for working with those those pieces of runners. Yeah, we, so. we were thinking about doing that actually when we were first looking into um, getting new yeah, enclosures. I went on Marketplace and bought a bunch of – I bought a – Sliding glass window. It was a curved window for a curved glass shower. Some guy had it yep. on there for like a hundred bucks with a frame and everything. And I thought I'm going to make my own closure. And we had a closet that we didn't use. That was, it was a double, it was like a four foot wide closet and seven feet tall. 
and I was just going to build it into the closet and have it built in. And then I realized that was a bad idea. So I ended up building a cart and then finding out the, the, the glass separation on it was like this. One. So any Aww. feeders we throw in there going to get out. And truthfully, if they really want, they could probably squeeze through it. And I was like, I'm just getting rid of this. So it was a, it was a great kind of, but it, it the DU, DIY glass didn't work. So, but we ended up uh, getting cages through a trade with a cage company. Yeah. I did a, I'm like, hey, instead of money, <laughs> could I cage <laughs> So we finally actually just got them set up, and we're we're building them out right now. But yeah, they're oh, what what size are they? They're three foot by two foot by six foot. Yeah, nice. Yeah, cool. So the three foot wide, two feet, six feet tall. Mm-hmm. So we wanted to go four feet wide, but we don't have the living space for the, the area for it. So yeah, that's why we're going that route. Was your ceiling mm-hmm. in the room? About seven feet. So with yeah. the, I was yeah. worried with being, we got to make casters for them with the casters, whatever size I end up getting. We ended up changing out the lighting and having a light fixture on top. I didn't want to jab into the ceiling. So I figured six was a yeah, good yeah. size, yeah. you know. I must admit, yeah. when we built the herb room, it was like there were reptiles downstairs, previous house, there were reptiles all through the house. Um, Obviously, the venomous were in a locked room separately sort of thing. And it's, I don't know, you get a bit older and you sort of want the house back to yourself as opposed to scattered mm-hmm. through with reptiles. It's, yeah, so the, the hurt room for us, I was like, fuck yeah, build that thing. <laughs> the yeah. crickets. The crickets are what we're driving me crazy at night. And <laughs> finally having a room, not listening to crickets at night, I was like, oh, this is so nice. <laughs> Especially the one that escapes. He, I reckon he's worse mm-hmm. than the entire, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Don't miss that either. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, wedge himself. It's impossible to reach area. Yeah, <laughs> thank God they don't live forever, that's for sure. Um, mm. Yeah. So I, I suppose, you know, one of the questions that, that we always like to sort of ask is, you know, who do you admire in, in your professional circles? Like, who do you look up to, I suppose, as a, as a another artist or a mentor or, you know, how does that sort of fit for you guys? So there's there's a couple, few people, a couple people, yeah. um, mainly Tell Hicks for me. He is yeah. just yep. such a huge inspiration. His work is absolutely insane. The yep. it, You know, there, there's so many different elements in his piece that are amazing. The Obviously, the anatomy, the lighting the movement in his pieces, um, the composition of pieces, like everything comes together and just looks so beautiful and flawless. That's the one he did of the beardies that we have on the wall. Yeah, we've got one of, of three beardies. Uh, we've got a print of uh, the Bones Pipe, and we've got the Lace Monitor ones. You got the They're just, Yeah, we've got we've got a bunch we of them here. at the auctions anytime one comes up. <laughs> exactly. yeah, we, we try to get it. So we have a small... Uh, Little fortune of prints in yeah the collection <laughs> maybe, maybe maybe someday I saw I saw a lace monitor original in person and that's like the closest thing I've ever come to a spiritual experience was seeing that thing because uh, the colors it's so rich it's so vibrant like the print looks great the print looks awesome but seeing the original there's so much more depth to it and like life to it. I almost don't know how to how to explain it, but that was just super cool. And he's so sweet. He's so kind. Um, you know, just really, really motivating, really inspiring. Uh, Bob Ashley, he'll bring him over in a video call sometimes throughout the shows. I bring Tell over, and I can say hi to Tell. And I like, I I'm I still get yeah. that like nerd <laughs> girl energy anytime Tell's around. I'm like, oh, yeah. Tell <laughs> here. So I I'm. A bit shy. I feel really bad because he he used to come out to Timley and he would do live painting during the show, but I was always so nervous that I never talked to him. <laughs> I would like I'd watch, but I was like I'd be too nervous yeah. to actually interact. And and I wish I would have because um you know his his work is just super super awesome. Um, but yeah, Bob Ashley, Brian Potter, they run the North American uh, Reptile Breeders Conference up here. They're they're both super awesome. They're wonderful people and. Bob's always got fun, fun, cool stories. There's, there's so many, honestly, there's so many people, so many really cool herpers that I just really, really enjoy talking to and seeing the shows. It's one of my favorite things about the shows. It's just 
chatting and hearing everybody's stories. It's always really so, cool. so the social side and stuff like that is what you're really engaging mm-hmm. in. Yeah, for sure. Because, I mean, truly, when, when you go to enough shows, it there isn't a whole lot of new stuff that really gets you surprised. Uh, you get these sensitivities to it. Yeah, every so often there'll be a new species that you haven't really seen before, or there'll be something new, and that'll be cool. But for the most part, usually it's all stuff that you've seen before. But you don't get to see, you know, your friends from the opposite end of the country yeah. very often. So yeah. it's always just really fun hearing everybody's adventures, where they've been, what they've found. Um, that's kind of my, I think my favorite part about it. Yeah, I would agree with that as well. Um, I think too, the internet desensitizes you a bit. Um, like we're that old, it was, we were around before the internet. Um, and I can remember when we first met and we were sitting together on a lounge and we were talking about one day going to ham. And then when Andreas flew mm-hmm. us over for the uh, release of Australasia and the Lapids, we went to ham because that's where he was releasing it. And we were so excited. and. It was a lot of one thing, but it it was also like, oh, cool, but I've seen that on YouTube. I've, you know, I've seen that on Facebook um, mm-hmm. and you can't handle it anyway. Um, and then there's a realization of, well, there's no point in getting excited over that because I can't take it home anyway. And yeah, for us, it, it was more the social side as well. Like it was cool to see it in the flesh, but it was the social side of say people we've been chatting to for years on Facebook or Okay. forums or whatever <laughs> and actually being able to meet up with them we found that a lot cooler than the animals so, like you have a long time friend and then actually be able to get together in person is just it's so cool yeah, it, it's, yeah. it's kind of surreal though isn't it at the same time it's like okay I, i've never seen you actually in the same been in the same room <laughs> for 10 15 years but it's like yeah i'll speak to you on a first name basis we know what's going on with each other in their lives etc cetera, etc cetera. it's like oh but now i'm actually physically meeting you for the first time so it's oh okay they're a bit shorter or they're a bit taller or, or whatever oh you know, for sure like, yeah you know, well, if they so, don't have the fa- the photo as a like the profile and you've never actually seen what they look like and i'm sort of like oh, you look like not that what i was me. expecting <laughs> time. that always gets me like people that will come up oh, I'm friends and they you i don't know i don't know who you are and then they'll tell me like, oh well you've got a lizard as your profile photo and no photos of yourself yeah, yeah. yeah. Funny. and i stare to take it in and then feel bad <laughs> yeah. cool um so where did I, you I guys the... meet oh sorry about <laughs> sorry just before we get onto that one just the one thing i wanted to talk about have you been down to bob ashley's place down at uh, in the Chiricahua, was there or not? We, yeah, we, 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 were, really, we were supposed to. Yeah, we were supposed to last year. Mm. So we... Huh? No, was it last year or the year before? Most both times, times we tried. Oh, yeah. 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 So when your van broke? Yeah. Yes, yeah. so the vehicle issues are kind of what stopped that because we were going to hit his place up on the way back. Yeah. And then last year we talked about trying to just like fly out to make a trip out of it, but we didn't get to. Um, yeah, he's so sweet. Every time yeah. I see him, he's like, you got to come out. You got to come out. You know, got to check out the Chiricahua Museum. There's all this artwork. There's so much cool stuff in there. Yeah, well, and I see I, I all the stuff that, that he brings home. Yeah. I wanted that incredible mosaic that Tell did. So when they, yeah. were, when they were doing it's that cool. together, right? so this is the, the amazing thing that I was sort of you know, talking about, how, how incredible an artist Tell Hicks is, right? Is it's like most people think that he does painting and painting is his main thing. And and of course painting and drawing is his, his main thing. But then you look at this incredible mosaic that he did in tiles out the front of the cow museum there of a hill monster. And it's like and you couldn't pick a better animal either to do like as a mosaic yeah. and that bead like sales like it, it's pretty insane the the plasticity, I suppose, as or diversity as an artist that he could be and how valuable he was to so many different things. Yeah, it's uh, we learned about how he er- made the the shirt designs originally with the screen yeah. printing process it's about the clear sheet and how he would lay them on top of each other and then one sheet would have one color and it would just be stacked and I was like that is the coolest thing like there's so many different levels the way and he avenues broke down and colors is just insane. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's it's dick. That's <laughs> incredible. Yeah, they, it- I, I suppose so. That sort of leads me to the my, my next question in regards to that. So, have you tried to do any other mediums? I mean, mainly you, you're using uh, pencils and 
text is that right and like and occasionally a bit of watercolor uh, it's actually copic markers yeah primarily so they're the alcohol um fine art marker based from japan so that's mostly what i use but i also do acrylic painting as well so i i really enjoy the copics because they're a lot of fun i can get really tight details in there and as you can tell i love my details <laughs> um <laughs> On occasion, uh, when I want to do a bigger piece or I want to do something for a show or maybe just I feel like doing a really large size, I'll do acrylic paint. So I'd like to get back into oils. I haven't used oils in years. They're a lot of fun. I just haven't yet. Um, I've done some sculpting in the past, but not in a long time. So it's all stuff that I kind of want to get back to exploring again and trying. So What's what's the favorite most favorite piece you've done out of everything you've done? What's What's the piece you're most proud of? I would say the black caiman. That's my favorite right now. Um, and my favorites change depending on, I guess, what <laughs> what comes up next and what I've worked on. So it was the Gariel for a long time. I was really proud of that one because I was terrified of drawing water. I'd never drawn water before. And in the image, he's got his mouth open, but I added the fish. I want to make sure it was a snake head where they are now. And so I pieced all that together and found out about the Copic Award through a friend that they were accepting entries. And so we were like, oh, yeah, let's check it out. When was the deadline? And the deadline was like in an hour. <laughs> yeah. I Well, it said that day. So yeah. we we're like, wait a minute, what date? And it was the, the following day. But in Japan, that was an hour and a half away. So oh. we got on, we took a picture of it. And we were doing our best to submit it. And the computer kept refreshing and kept refreshing, mm -hmm. saying it's not going through. And then finally, we we're like, this ain't going to happen. Then we hit refresh again, and it finally went through. But it said, it said submitted. And then we refreshed it again and it said, sorry, submissions are closed. So we're like, oh. what was happening? Did it go through or not? Yeah. So we go on the website and we go to all the very, you can see all the submissions. And you scroll to the very, very bottom in the very last submission. Was her. Uh, <laughs> nothing like that in a panic, went... is it? <laughs> well, yeah. So, yeah, I submitted it, and then I forgot about it. Yeah, month, months ago. Like, I literally completely forgot about it. I think it was, like, four months, yeah, maybe. Probably something like that. Maybe four months or so go by, and then I get an email that just says, uh, check out the winners. And I'm like, okay, well, I, yeah. That... And we're in bed. We're sitting here hanging like, out. I, I so didn't, she jumps up. You know, I didn't win anything, but I, I want to see all the cool art that did win. And so I just clicked on it because I was bored. <laughs> and I'm scrolling <laughs> down. And Garfield's on there. And I'm like, that's not right. I refreshed it. I was like, that has to be like my submission. And they're like, something, something wrong happened. So I refreshed it. And then it was there again. And then it had judges comments on it. And I was like, no, -uh, no way. So I got the regional award for North America and didn't know it. <laughs> and, um, so I was super, super excited. They had, there was a really nice judges note on there. And so that was like a really, really proud moment. Cause one, I didn't know it was even going to get in on time Two, I wasn't expecting to be able to make it. There was like over 3000 entries and um, yeah, I wasn't like notified or anything. So I was just, <laughs> Super, super so that was a piece that I was super proud of for a really long time. Um, so that's that's one of them. But the the black came in I really like a lot because I got a lot of details in there and I like the, the scale shine on it. <laughs> so that's yeah. my favorite. Chris, you're a photographer, yeah? Yeah. What's your favorite piece that you've done yourself? Uh I haven't really photographed a whole lot of uh wildlife actually. I haven't done a whole lot of I did a lot of studio so I was always in, the, in a studio shooting near the pile of products, photograph it, you know? So I haven't done anything, like, really. Yeah, I haven't done anything, you know, I'm saying, in a long time. Photography, yeah. So uh, there's a few. Uh, if I could go out and do anything, like, I, I'm a huge, I love wildlife photography, but um, I liked, uh, I do, I used to do, like, light painting where you long exposures of, like, uh, prod, you know, like a car or something outside or long exposures of stars that I've done a, cool, a few things like that, that I'm proud of, but I can't really think of anything offhand because it's a long time since I've really done it. So are you doing like star trial stuff or is that what you're I've never done anything like that. 
never had the setup to follow the stars or anything like yeah. that, but uh, pretty much as long as photo night or or I've done colla- like photo collages where it kind of looks exactly. like it. But yeah. Yeah. Cool. What's the? F- no, I've had a crack at had a crack at doing some astrophotography and. Oh, it's it's not easy. It's, it's, like, <laughs> yeah. um, like I'm I'm a half reasonable photographer, I think. Anyway, and like I understand the composition side of things and all the rest of it. And I understand the technical way of doing the the imagery for that. And I'm trying to avoid one of the things I'm trying to do is actually try and do some star work with an animal in the foreground, mm-hmm. but doing in the same in, in same exposure. And the, the difficulty of that is is that I've got to move the focus plane in the image at the time because you've got to have focus on infinite when you're shooting stars, but you mm-hmm. need the focus on the animal in the foreground as well. So there's a little bit of dicking around and then not causing any shaking and stuff like that. So I'm still yeah. playing with it. But, or can I do um, like multiple exposures and stacking it? Yeah, so I was curious how, so the, how those shots the, get taken. Yeah, but the issue with that is is that you can't, Submit most of those to competitions. Oh, really? Yeah, I guess it's yeah, easy. So when you, it's a single exposure, right? So they yeah. allow minimal amount of Photoshop, et cetera, et cetera. So there's no cropping, no, you know, cropping, dust removal, all that sort of stuff. But that's about it, right? So, uh, I can, yeah, you could take two images and do an overlay and do it relatively simply that way. But I've, I've been mucking around and I'm sort of getting there with a bit of it, but I'm not quite happy with it yet. So, um, it's a, it's an interesting thing, but I, I love photography in the sense that you can completely you've got all these really set rules, which I like to I, I like rules and all the rest of it. It's the way I am. I'm a bit anally retentive like that, but at the same time too, I love being able to break them too and go the exact opposite and go right. I'm not going to use the rule of thirds, and I'm not going to do this, and I'm not going to do that, and then seeing what comes out, you know, mm-hmm. and you get this form of art as well, which is fantastic. But I think there too That's with photos. Yeah. It is in the eye of the beholder. Like, God will show me his photos and I'll show you him mine. And he'll he'll he won't hold back. He'll be like, that shit. And I'll be like, okay, I didn't think it was my greatest, but I didn't yeah. think it was that bad. <laughs> and then he goes away for work yeah. and whatnot and he'll show me his and I'll be like, they're crap. I don't know why everyone likes your photos so much. <laughs> so <laughs> critique at each other. Well, yeah, that's, that's, funny. that's like even with her her drawing, she's like, Can you tell me what you're really thinking? And He's gotten really good at critiquing. Sometimes I'm like, I'm not trying to hurt your feelings, but that looks like shit. You know, like this isn't you're 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 you get to a level where you're constantly trying to better yourself. And if I just constantly tell you it's great, then you're yeah, not gonna, not gonna yeah. you know, yeah. it's yeah. same with everything. Yeah. And being and an not, artist, you're probably your own worst critic, both of you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's it's very easy to do, but sometimes like. It's just nice to have a fresh eye, someone that hasn't been staring at a piece for 10 hours with, you know, cross eyes going in opposite directions. <laughs> I'm really bad, though. Sometimes I'm like, can you just look at it real quick? I'll glance. I'm like, it's good. Okay, you're good. Keep going. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> look at it. The detail. Look There's at the detail. Here. <laughs> yeah. Tell me what I need good. to do. Well, there's, there's a couple pieces, like, because I photograph it, and then what I do is I cut it out. So that's, like, literally what I've been doing. That's, like, the most photography I do now lately is, I. I photo or print, so I go and I get to cut it out. So I'm staring at it blown up, so I get to see all the little details. And there's been a couple of times where I'm like, "You screwed this up." And she's like, "Shit, we can't tell." <laughs> like, there's a, there's a scale area really uh, missing, and she's like, "Can you just Photoshop it or something?" I'm like, yeah, I got you. Oh, you've let out Where? secrets there. <laughs> oh, that's well, awesome. it's, it's not too often, but there's yeah. occasions. How do you guys find it working with each other, traveling with each other? I'd, I'd kill Scott if I was in with him 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and I mean that lovingly. I can't though. stand it. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say we have two different <laughs> answers. Oh, which is what we want. Like, honesty is, oh, uh, honesty is as far as you're comfortable with i guess <laughs> we're, we're pretty lucky because we don't we don't mind it like i mean we're, we're pretty much we well we live together and we work together and we're not we don't separate we're not separated very often mm-hmm. and we still we're not really uh at each other's throats that often so if ever no it it i think what helped is we were really friends for a long time before 
we actually were together. And so we already kind of had that, I guess, down. I already knew she was crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much, basically. You knew what you were getting yourself yeah. into. So. And you all like There's crazy really, about like, this. That's it. <laughs> no, same. <laughs> no, nothing, nothing really new ever comes up, so. We find the it's most we good. argue about is reptiles, like the husbandry side. I want to do something, or Scott wants to do something, and like we'll yeah. have a few arguments here and there, but it's it's nothing really. You're giving me stink nothing. eye. Is that not correct? Yeah. <laughs> nah, it's, it's spirited conversation. Uh, <laughs> Robot. Wait, that's what we're. Over. Need to add, add, add in some. Uh, is it boxing bell? The ding. <laughs> yeah. <right. laughs> Refer back to his comment oh, about but... being anal. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is what it is, isn't it? Like you, you, you figure out what you, what works for you guys as a couple, and you know that's that's mm-hmm. that's exactly what you want to do. And and I mean, from our point of view too, like we, yeah, we argue and, and stuff like that, but it's never with malice or anything like that. It's it's always mm-hmm. it's always just we're both passionate about things, and two passionate people coming together. Sometimes it's not always going to hit the right way at times. You know, it is what it is. So an enthusiastic um, discussion. Yeah, and then make 100%. up sex. So you know. <laughs> <laughs> where, where did where did you guys meet? We actually met at the Tinley Park show, uh, March twenty fourteen. Yeah, so this month will be ten years. Mm-hmm. Well done. So, Chris, you were yes. you were into herps as well, then to be at Tinley, I'm assuming. No, just there to pick up right. Okay, so how? Okay, <laughs> was it? So so was kidding. <laughs> My buddy at the time was like, hey, you want to come out? We're, you know, a reptile show. And I was like, no. <laughs> he's like, they're weird. If we're just getting drunk and parties, I'm like, I'm in. <laughs> so he's like, we got to, oh, it's great. So, and uh, yeah, that might have been my, I don't know if I, that was my first or second one where I met you. My first Tinley. I don't know, maybe my second one. I don't remember. And uh, yeah, so I was just there hanging out and I was sitting by the fireplace and she, it was really cold out. And then she came in with a friend and sat down next to me. And the uh, rest is history. I asked him what he kept, and he goes, nothing. Go talk to my roommate. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that guy over there, he keeps a lot of stuff. She wants to keep, I'm like, geckos. And she's like, oh. I was in the snakes, and I was like, geckos. <laughs> Oh, dork. Then here I am with geckos. Yeah. So, oh I, I, yeah. I suppose, Chris. You know that's an interesting one. You know, like you've come into the hobby as a, as a late bloomer, I suppose, in some ways, right? Where, what do you find interesting? What's your, what do you like as a herb? What, what herbs do you really? What gets your fire going? You know, it's kind of funny because, like, our our buddy Bob. We go to his place in Georgia all the time. He's got a lot of really cool ball pythons. And I'm thinking about it. And I don't care about ball pythons. I like them. They're great. But I just, they don't, they don't do a lot for me. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I don't follow the genetics like they do. And I know those guys are super passionate about it. And I think that's really cool. And I, I admire that. But he bought one of those California garters. And I was so amped to see that thing. Because I never seen one in person. And there it was. You've seen the pictures of it. And it's stuff like, you know, that was really neat. Like that, that stuff kind of got me excited. Like when we go herping, like we found the, the knob tail out in the desert. Or even the, the, the horn lizard. Not, not the horn <laughs> lizard. Yes. Yeah, sorry. The horn lizard. Those were really cool. That would be crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I have not been to Australia yet. I was like, no. what? You didn't wait? No. rude. <laughs> New invasive species. Yeah. 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 Knob tails on the news. <laughs> Your life is green. Yeah, I would love to if I've never seen... I just think a green snake. You, when you're a little kid, you always envisioned a snake, and it was just a green snake. I've never seen one in the wild. I just want to see a green snake. My luck, it'll be a mamba or something. Catch my ankle. <laughs> well, come out here. We can yeah, provide well, I mean, the nobbies as well. <laughs> all right. That would be so... <laughs> yeah, I mean, oh, there's, there's right, nothing yeah. quite like... Sorry, go on. What was that? Oh, I didn't realize when I first met Chris that he didn't like... He wasn't really a big, like the big snakes, the big snakes <laughs> or tarantulas. Yeah. Spiders. I just didn't like them. Yeah. So I brought home a, a 
14 foot tick and had no idea that he was cool with it. <laughs> well, I've also <laughs> like nine nine of the population where I thought these are just giant creatures that are just like going to size me up and murder my dog and me. <laughs> like, yeah. Lying next to you in the bed, <laughs> like many length, or sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. I was going to come back and bench next to me and be like, yeah, I think he'll fit. Yeah. <laughs> Thomas, never thought of that. Uh, and I'm like, hey, can you like watch the animals while I'm out of town? And he was such a sport about it. He didn't. I had no. Like he didn't. Didn't let on that he wasn't comfortable with that. Well, I found out too is if you just take a hook and you just kind of like, three ticks coming towards the bottom of the nose. He's like, oh, Jesus Christ, and runs off. You know, hides in the corner. You know, so I realized they're just giant babies. You know, they're just like the small ones. But obviously, they can be dangerous. But this one was nice. He was a good dog. <laughs> Where do so you in other words, basically, up? Adeline, you're you like poker with Chris. Because if you didn't know that he didn't like this stuff initially, you know. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Where do you go for inspiration? Oh, times I will get randomly. I'll have like a a random hanging for certain species sometimes photographs hankering exactly <laughs> like a i'll just i'll just think of one randomly sometimes when i've got really photos that i'll see that will give me an idea to do a piece um mm-hmm. so kind of it kind of depends there's there's so many different ways to go about it when we go out herping i'm always trying to get really good reference photos uh for the artwork but depending on the situation sometimes it works it doesn't so uh, usually it's it's either seeing really cool photos or just wanting to work on a species and coming up with a composition in my head. And then I got down something that I can like at least kind of refer to to be able to make it happen. So some pieces will be Frankenstein together where it's the body of one animal, the head of another, tail, just, you know, drawn in with a pen. And then I'll have a bunch of photos next to me to look at the sky scale details for the faces or whatnot and then other times it'll be uh a piece based on a direct photo of an animal that you know if their color is off see their whole body they're arranged in a really good composition that would work well for a piece then like that checks all my boxes and i, I work straight off of it and then other times i do have to mishmash it and make my own my own thing. we've seen yeah, some of the that, ama- that, that's sorry <laughs> the lag is terrible <laughs> We've seen some of the amazing pieces you've done for US Arc and and stuff. What's the what's your favorite different medium that you've worked with? Like the skateboard, oh. and that was so cool. Yeah, <laughs> that was fun. The skateboards were fun. The surfboard I had wanted to do for a long time, so I had wanted a surfboard for like a year, and then we finally were able to find one to bring down there and to work on. So that was a lot of fun. Surfboard might be. Yeah, it was hard to get rid of that surfboard. That yeah. was such a nice surfboard. <laughs> we guy in Marketplace bought it in Hawaii. He was stationed in Hawaii and bought it and then brought it back. So it was like a really nice surfboard. It was legit. And we got it for like 150 bucks. So I was like, I kind of just want to keep it because I've always wanted a surfboard. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're to surf, but it was a like beautiful surfing, a little river in Illinois. nearby. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, didn't do much. A bit of wind chop Maybe on the lake. Late in the lake a little bit, but yeah, yeah, that was a, a fun one. Sorry. The long boards and the skateboards are fun. I'm trying to think of like we painted on bottles. Bottles are cool. The hat. Oh yeah, the, the hat. hat. That one was a random last minute. So a lot of people think that I plan these things out, but my secret is oh. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I um, you for one it. of them. <laughs> Yeah, I wing it. I always wing it because I'm always so busy preparing for the show itself that I kind of end up leaving the planning of my, you know, auction piece. It becomes a bit of a minute. So for the last Arlington show in Texas, I was going to paint on a bottle. And I, I already knew that before we left. I was like, okay, well, when I get there, I'm going to pick up a good bottle of whiskey that's got surface area and I'll do like a really cool... Texas species on it, and we forgot to get a bottle. Well, Saturday the liquor stores don't open until like noon over there, and uh, where we're at, and I'm like, you need to be drawing on it way before then. So 
That's one. I don't know who thought of it or who said it. Yeah, there there's a Starbucks in the lobby of the hotel right across the way that had cowboy hats for sale. And we had seen it, but we think it like it didn't register at all. And then somebody else was like, oh man, it'd be so cool if you painted on a cowboy hat. It's like that's what we're doing. <laughs> yep. Oh yeah, that was a fun how one. That you, was how do you go about work. even how do you I bet it's like setting that up so it doesn't move and stuff like that. They're like, yeah, Chris, come and sit down here. You need to sit here for eight hours. No move. <laughs> <laughs> You're just sitting there and you're drawing. Yeah, out. Yeah, 100%, just like a big tattoo session. Or, like Actually, that, on head. that was a hat because she could hold it and move it and just like. It was easy yeah, to move around. Just yeah. sat on her lap. Usually when I'm painting on larger things, I have to like display it. Or if it's the bottle, I have to like paint it so people can Be see it. Be careful you don't drop it. Yeah, yeah, but the hat worked out well, oh, and it because it's shit. round. I paint on one side and then flip flip it over. I had a day and a night scene. I had a colored lizard. Um, I think I had like Ooh. a couple different rattlesnakes on there. I actually, don't know. in the night, so that way people see walk, walking around. We saw That's photos cool. of that. That was yeah. insane. <laughs> it was really well done. Yeah, done a lot. I don't know, maybe. What all you painted on now? I sculpted on a a glass bottle. That one was my favorite. That one was fun. I, I don't sculpt you ever very see often. The crystal skull vodka. Oh, you ever I seen remember it that. Yeah. I don't know if you guys have. Yes, it's yeah. a yeah. Dan a- Akron. Mm-hmm. It's his his uh, his vodka. We uh, we got this clay that she sculpted a snake out of, and had it wrap around and made it look like it went in one eye and came out the other, and then she painted yeah. the deep. Painted the tank, and that one, I think that was that was really cool. That was my favorite. That, you that was a fun one. That yeah, I don't sculpt cool. very often, but I like it. How long does it take you to set up for a show? Like we've seen the photos, it's amazing. It, there's obviously a lot of work there. <laughs> um, the last one was really fast. We've gotten a lot around it. <laughs> it used to take one. like two and a half, three hours to set up, sometimes longer. Like mm-hmm. it was stupid. Because you're setting out so many little yeah. things. Mm-hmm. And now we was it at West Palm? I think we timed it. Set up in an hour. It was an hour at West Palm, yeah. And that's usually just taking our time, laying everything out. So we have everything. We, we The hard, hardware store out here had these bins that uh, they all kind of interlock together and everything kind of fits in perfect. We got lucky and found them and we bought like 30 of these things. Them. So we yeah. have a lot of bins that we bring with yeah. and everything just kind of stacks in and they're already in clear bins in the bins. So we just pick them up and set them on the table and kind of get ready to, you know, yeah, yeah. one ready and done. Roll. Yeah. And so. the beforehand, the behind the scenes bits of organizing everything, how long do you reckon that would take? <laughs> We, like we have a, month, a show. Month and a half. <laughs> we have a small show tomorrow, but we didn't have to really prep for it because it's just a, it's like a, one day thing, and it's only for a few hours really. So that we loaded that van. The van's already loaded up in the driveway, mm-hmm. so we just jump in tomorrow and go. We don't have many local shows though, so it's yeah. pretty rare that we get to do that. We weren't even gonna do it, but it was like it's in our backyard. It's twenty minutes from the house. Yeah, it's I can't not. Not do it. So it'll be fun. Yeah, it'll be good. But for for shows like Tinley, we started prepping. Um, how long ago? Three, two weeks ago. Yeah, a uh, month ago. Yeah, so we try to get prepped at least a month and a half. So we got we ordered new shirts to shirts. We got a whole new tumblers coming. We got new stickers. Uh, yeah, couple new stickers or a new sticker. I don't remember. We're in the process of rebranding too, so we got new, new banners. Banner. Yeah, I'm excited. Adam, I'm excited about because we've all wow. we've been using the same vinyl four foot by eight foot banner that just goes on a little pole, and it's kind of dorksaurus at the point, and it's just stupid. It's just it, it's it's dirty, and it's falling apart, and it makes me so mad setting it up. And then you see everyone else at the venues having these glorious banners. I'm, I'm so mad about this banner. So we have a new banner now, and I'm very so tomorrow the first time we actually get to use it. Yeah, it'll be fun. So uh, what, you know, sort of leads on to that and the next question is, you know, what projects are you guys working on that you can maybe tell us about? And it, look, if you can't tell us anything about 
other than you know, well, I mean, you know about the Bearded totally Dragon, totally like that's that's pretty cool. What, <laughs> what, what can you tell? What what sneak peeks can you tell us about? Yeah, we won't tell so anyone, and, and neither will our listeners. We promise. <laughs> currently working on a lot of stuff. Um, yeah. Yet at the same time, simplifying, which like sounds kind of silly considering we've got a lot going on, but uh, we've got a new studio that we've slowly been working on moving into. I'm currently working out of it now, but we're still in the phase of some parts of it. So mm-hmm. we're working on the building. I started a Patreon that's it's not quite launched and ready yet, but I've been working on getting Patreon together. So there's coloring sheets that there there's some sneak peek of new pieces in there um i'm hoping to be doing some tutorials and intro videos about you know what we're doing and like my whole process so looking up on there too and uh i've got one piece that i'm wrapping up now that um uh, i will be auctioning off to hopefully help raise funds for her her medical Wills, so that'll be coming up, mm-hmm. and um, got some got species. I'm still trying to work out on what I want to work on in the next two. Trying to hack out as much as you can, yeah. pretend me. So I'm trying to decide on like what I need to do for the show, and what would be really fun. So I'm kind of I'm still still deciding in that department. But yeah, working on the studio, working on Patreon mo- mostly, and then trying to get new traditionals out. How do you balance work and free time? Or do you not just have free time? <laughs> I've actually just started kind of changing my entire routine for that. So I know nobody probably realizes this, but I've kind of been almost burnt out for the most of the last of the three years. <laughs> um, because life balance was non-existent. And it's hard because this is something that I'm super passionate about and I love it and I want to go completely into it. But at the same time, it's just, it gets exhausting when that never turns off when, you know, I'm in the shower, I'm thinking about work. I'm laying in bed. I'm thinking about work. My friends are asking me to go out and think about work and there's no getting away from it. And if I'm away from it, I feel guilty. And if I'm working, I'm exhausted because I've been working so much. So it's like, it's been a really difficult balance and working from home too. Previously, at the old place we were at, there was a room that I would be able to do my artwork in and then the rest of the house. And so at least there was a little bit more of a separation. But when we moved here, we're kind of almost in a studio apartment size space. So like I was drawing right over there and then we had the bedroom and the animals. And, you know, I'd be folding my laundry, staring at my desk, feeling guilty for not working and I'd be working, feel guilty that, oh, well, I need to change the, the animal's water. I need to fold my laundry. I need to blah, blah, blah. So I got tired of it. And I finally started to try to set a schedule in place for myself that I would actually follow. Mm-hmm. So I've got alarms that tell me, all right, it's time to work. It's lunchtime. Time to get back to work and work. And started just really researching really good tips and tricks to how to best manage your time. So I've been listening to a lot of like those type of podcasts and um, scheduling things out. So previously I had a bunch of things going on at the same time and I'd constantly be in a panic because I couldn't get it all done. And now what I'm doing is I'm scheduling only like one and maybe two things per day to work on. So that way it's a realistic goal and if I have extra time, then I can work on some other stuff. And that's like an extra little win. That's not something that's expected to be done the day. So but that's a, being able that's to manage. For you, isn't it? Yeah. You know then it's like, like, that, that's a bonus for you. You're turning around and going, oh, okay, well, this is my scheduled work hours. Okay, I've got some spare time. I mean, I'm mentally, I'm in a good place. I've got everything I needed to get done at home. I don't really feel like yeah. relaxing. I'm going to get back in and actually do some drawing because I enjoy it. Yeah. So- the thing is it it brought back getting excited about work again and now you know when i I leave work i get home i take care of the animals i i you know spend time with my horse the dogs chris but we all hang out whatever in in the order dogs horse chris (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> oh, Chris, I feel you. I feel you, buddy. I'm in exactly the same boat. It's like, oh. you know, the puppy's run, cute. I, Dakota, I can't help it. And then me. Yeah, I, it's all right. I get that too. You know. <laughs> you got two little. Oh. Oh, but yeah, it's uh, nice to be able to actually enjoy. It. It's funny because the, the time away from it makes me enjoy getting back to it even more, and it actually gives me more ideas yeah. to be able to get back to it. So that's that's helped tremendously. Cool. Um, so, you know, you said you, you guys have got dogs. What what dogs have you got? So we've got a one-eyed bulldog who's a very grouchy old man. He's not very nice. He's kind of a jerk. He's <laughs> keeping nice. He's keeping nice. He wants to love everybody. Well, no. He wants, <laughs> he, wants about- he wants to love everybody and he wants attention from everybody. But he also, like, wants you to take his toy so he can bite you at the same time. Oh. So <laughs> um, and then our other dog is this super sweet little old lady. So she belonged to my great aunt and was a dog found during Hurricane Katrina in 2005. And so she was in Louisiana. And they found her at the Clico Electric Plant. So they named her Clico. And she was an outside dog that has roamed 40 acres Basically, her entire life until 2019? Yeah. 18 or 2019? Yes, 2019. So my great aunt passed, and I was actually going to ask the family, like, hey, what's going on with this little dog? You know, where, where is she going? And they asked us if we would take her, and I was super happy and excited. Right. She's a little sweetheart. And um, when we got her, she was super over. So she's, imagine a loader beagle. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of how. <laughs> So she's like a little mini bull, but with really long body, little legs. She, she was three pounds and she lost over 10 pounds. Yeah, for, for a little dog, that's, yeah. you know, that's a lot. So her yeah. belly was practically she like... She had scraps and she oh. had a, a, a one gallon ice cream. She had one of those in the garage just filled with food and then had a scrap pot that they'd throw their, their old food in the foods and she just rummaged through it. So yeah. she wasn't allowed to the house. <laughs> I'd, I'd wait, dog. Yeah, so she's got a wild card and a free range chicken. Yeah, but now she's a little <laughs> couch potato thing inside, and I mean, we love her very much. She's got cataracts, she's super deaf. Like, I she's, think she's starting to go see now because she's like 20 years old now. It's like the oldest dog I think I've ever heard. And she of. just stares at like the wall, or like you'll call her and she'll just be like, <laughs> just look, look <laughs> like random. God does that now. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I haven't had her yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, those are our guys. Yeah, Where do you see you got yourselves professionally and personally in five years? That's a good question. That is a very good question. I honestly hadn't thought about any type of future until like a couple weeks ago. <laughs> I mean, we always kind of plan, but we just want, you know, we kind of want to be doing this. I don't think we want to do as many shows because we do like third. Well, one year we did like almost 20 shows. It Maybe it's over 20 shows, like yeah. two or 23 shows in one year. Sorry, was that when you're starting yeah. out and you were trying to get your name out? Yeah. yeah. It's hard, isn't it? Yeah. Because you don't know how you're going to do until you get there and you try them out. Yeah. And, you know, you just don't know. But it got really hard because we we're nonstop back to back leaving and on the road. And I wasn't really getting any new art because I was on the road the whole time. So I didn't really have a whole lot of new stuff for folks. And so I'm hoping to, you know, we're both hoping to be able to cut back on our shows a little bit and spend more time here to work on stuff. And then when we do go to the show, because we're not going so frequently, we can take our time and we can check stuff out and go look at zoos and go herping and not have to rush back because we've got another show coming up. Yeah, but no, we I th- I'd like to, well, I think in the long run, though, in the next five years, we'd like to be, I don't know, I don't really know how to answer that, really. I mean, I, I know we just mm. want to be doing the same thing, but I want to say yeah. better. More <laughs> you know? and better. Le- yeah. Fewer yeah. shows would be nice. Traveling is great. Yeah, mm-hmm. it, it's, a, it's really fun, but it's, uh, one thing, too, is like our vehicles, okay, we got an old van, old Sprinter van, and um, mm-hmm. it, it runs great sometimes. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like, so every now and then we've had a few breaks. Uh, Anybody stressful. that bends with us, they know they're, they're like, always like, "Say, how's the trip?" I'm like, "I don't talk." 
So it'd be yeah. nice to get something like more main nor more streamlined, you know, just we don't know. Well I don't really know how to answer that yeah. I guess. Just, I just wanna be a better artist and continue working to yeah. get as good as yeah. I can. There's so many pieces that I've wanted to do for a really long time. Uh, one of them is I'd love to do a life-size casuary with uh, oh wow that trying to like you really got to do a work research trip out to Queensland yeah that would be awesome so you have to pay for accommodation <laughs> <laughs> yeah and you, you guys can, have those near free. you. No, not really, but we've got parentes in our yard, so you can come and, put, come and do oh checking on God. the parentes and then <laughs> go from looking at the parentes, then do a trip up North Queensland and then go chasing cassowaries, you know. Or, or, or murder chickens, yeah, as I prefer I... to call them, you know. Chickens? Yeah. That's a pretty good name. There was a guy in Florida a few years ago. That, that, yeah, that I got nailed by him. went into the enclosure and he had... Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're, they're fucking to- their toes are no joke, eh? Like, they are fucking full on. Oh, it's like um, a insane. Just the one giant shake. Yeah, one of our sweet <laughs> friends, he cast a cat oh, yeah. of a foot, and he knew how much Chris loved him, and so he, he randomly surprised us with this cast of a foot, yeah. which is really cool. That's awesome. But yeah, there's, there's just so many, like, cool projects I would love to do, so I think that's I got, that's I'll, in the I'll future. Yeah. Oh, wow. Anything. That is cool. That yeah. is cool. But, yeah. so it's basically it's like a shake. Like, yeah. 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 It's like a, a, a five-inch really long uh, knife attached to the end of the yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, this was there was a guy uh, vending the show selling all these different casts, and he had this there, and um, it wasn't even that expensive. It's just you know sometimes you're like ah, I just can't justify it, you know. Yeah, I, I mean it was a rough go. I, yeah, I went back fully. later on. I'm like you know screw it, I'm gonna go buy that thing, and it was gone. <laughs> His island brought one and it was sold out. I, went, I told my buddy uh, Russ Russ Gurley about it and um then uh a couple weeks go by and i was helping him with uh, making some stickers for him mm-hmm. and he's like hey what's your address i'm gonna i got a gift for you and i thought he's gonna send me like a couple stickers or something and then he sends me this so i was like you're the best thing ever so it's been sitting <laughs> Way up better than stickers. <laughs> yeah that's, that's, that's a cool murder trinket murder right trinket, yeah. it's just cool <laughs> what other yeah, well, animals I mean... are on you oh <laughs> Sorry, yeah, come on, babe. What other animals are on your bucket list? For herping or for drawing? Anything. Whatever. Either, like, both, either. really. That's, yeah. Yeah. My, my number one goal is to go to Ecuador. Um, it's kind of the first the first stop I want to go to. I'd love to see Bushmasters in the wild. I think that would be super mm. awesome. I'm, I'm half Ecuadorian, and most of my family oh. is gone, but I have yet to go, and it drives me crazy hearing all of my friends going to Ecuador and going herping, and I'm like, I haven't been there yet. <laughs> so I'd love to be able to go you should, you should check out with, the um, clubhouse. You, you follow Chicago and the, uh, Mike Pingleton. He does those tours down at, uh, in Peru. That would be super cool. They seem cool. to get Bushmasters pretty regularly, eh? So, I would love that. Yeah. That would just be amazing. So they're, they're one of them, um, you know, Galapagos iguanas would just be crazy cool. Mm-hmm. They're just so unique and so crazy looking. Uh, I'd love to be able to go to Batanta, look for blue tree monitors, and just look for basically all of the tree monitors for the most tree part. Monitor, tree monitors, crop monitors, be pretty neat. I think um, Lacy's, Parentes, Komodo Island would be neat. Komodo in the wild, just chilling. Yeah, you know, like yeah. seeing Solaris, yeah. seeing. Um, I love squams too. I'm a big squam enthusiast and so i'd love to be able to see those guys um it's so hard because there's just so many cool things that i just really want to see it's, so you, it's just really like, hard. you just like rattled off south america central africa papua new guinea yeah. australia yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. can we just play the globe i just want to see the globe <laughs> that's the thing is yeah. they've got just so many different interests but uh vipers are like my favorite to paint and draw they're they're a lot of fun so i really enjoy them a lot so i i can never get enough of like cool viper heads so yeah. those are those are my jam we we I sort of made pop- it like a a bit of a uh like a pact i suppose if for lack of a better term where we're like right we need to do like an overseas trip once a year 
we need to go somewhere yeah. once a year because if we don't we're going to end up being too old and not going to be able to enjoy some mm-hmm. of this stuff if we just wait till retirement sort of thing so we're trying to do like a, a a short overseas trip and then like a larger overseas trip every year and just get out of there and, and see That's some cool. stuff that'd be and, awesome you know like i mean well, bali's yeah. like a seven hour flight for us you know so oh wow um, you know, so looking at reticulated pythons and sea crates and mm-hmm. green tree vipers and, and stuff like that. And then, you know, it's 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 amazing. But then immersing yourself in the culture and just learning how other people do things across the globe is, is so inspiring as well. Mm-hmm. Oh, for sure. Yeah, that's that's my, my our goals eventually is to be able to travel more and check stuff out. So we're, we're still in the building process in terms of the business where, like, everything we make goes directly into it. Yeah. Um, like it, I mean that literally, I think a lot of people think that, yes. we're, you know, we might be out having fun with what we make at the show. Well, but... it's like that, the inner, what was it? You Googled that thing where, where it searched, we were like, oh, we were yeah. at the game and, it, and it looked up net worth and it said $5 million. So I have I'm a, like, a net worth of $5 million. <laughs> like, I'm like, where's this money? Okay. We're charging you when you stay here then. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Like oh, five million dollars. Huh? <laughs> things would be, would be a lot different. Yeah. yeah, for sure. We get that. We really yeah. get that. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, yeah. I'm maybe it's something I'm older. Uh, what is this thing? You, you can Google yourself and find out what your net worth is. I literally, I think we just Googled my name. I don't think it actually knows. It just. It's just like a. This is a Adeline Robinson art is a business. It's you know founded in Chicago in twenty twenty, and it gives you like all this business info. I honestly think it's it's Google's AI that goes yeah. through the makes this thing, and yeah. it just comes up with random information. Yeah, I don't know. so some of it's correct I'm because it's, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, try it. Try it. Yep. Weird. See what pops up. I'm gonna it. Yeah, people well, think you're loaded money. with the books and honestly royalties obviously the publisher yeah, has to make money rah 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 and i think people think you get yeah. a hell of a lot more than you do and yeah, yeah it's I, I totally get where you're coming from there <laughs> yeah sweatshop works right. like more per yeah. copy than what we do that's for sure I think our business has been going 20 odd years and we're st- sort of still in the, okay, the bookshop sort of didn't help. That was added expenditures that we weren't, we hadn't mm-hmm. counted on. It wasn't something we actually saw ourselves doing say five years ago. Um, but yeah, mm-hmm. we're still putting pretty much every cent back into it to get new stock yeah. or find something different. The thing is, you got to put a lot into it to be able to grow it. And, yeah. um, you know, it's, you can't make money without spending money. That's yeah. something I have to tell myself every time I, I have to make a big payment or something. I'm like, I've got to spend it to make it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We tried doing the, sh- we tried doing the shirts, uh, like doing shirts and stuff. And we had like 30 yeah. odd designs and 30, 40 designs. And, you know, by the time we, we sort of decided, okay, you need 30 designs. But then on top of that, then you need to go cater from small through to, 3XL, 4XL, or whatever it is, right? And then male shirts, female shirts, etc. So that one design ends up being 10 different yeah. shirts. Yeah. So you end, up having, this, yeah, and I was you end up having same this. Same as you, Chris, cutting out his and photos. Like, and yeah, it's hours it's like, and hours and hours. And then there's putting it into the website, as you both know, it's not a two minute exercise. And, oh, yeah. Yeah. We- like everyone asks, like, why aren't you doing T-shirts? And we're like, you have a hundred different prints that you have yeah. on, on the table right yeah. now. Think about that in apparel. All right. So, like you said, you need. What would we need to bring? Small, every, sweet, we had a T-shirt largest, of everything. Extra large is two X's, three X's, X and girls and, and or men, men's and women's clothes and sizes. And then now and you have to have at least ten of each. In the ones one that, color. Yeah, and, and how many colors you yeah, have? Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> And the, and and the neckline. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of people that have asked us, like, can these iron on a shirt? I'm like, no, it's a print. <laughs> yeah. Or yeah. people go, do you have yeah. this on a t shirt? I'm like, do you see t shirts? <laughs> well, Not being me. I'm like, now, but yeah. 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 I wish we had a t shirt, but we're not there yet. Yeah. We talked about getting our own DTG printer and just doing it all in house, but 
It's just so much work. work. Mm-hmm. And yeah, but then to do it at a price rate. too, to do it at a price point that it, that is sort of <laughs> worthwhile too, right? It's like, okay, you can mm-hmm. do direct printing yourself, but then if you factor in the time that's going to take you to set up the printer, load yeah. the image in, put it on, and then you know what? what and learning it with mistakes. That, <laughs> what's the efficiency yeah. rate of the it printing too, right? Minutes, How many fail? Sure. You know, yeah, yeah. And, and the bagging and sleeving. <laughs> Yes. yes. And yeah, then, it then was... folding them and sitting them right and then yeah. not having, you know, I mean, that for, for any of that sort of stuff, consistency is so important, right? You want the same. You don't want to change T-shirt companies. Mm-hmm. You don't want to change this. You don't want to change that because then you're changing the whole shirt. And then people, you know, one bad review and then suddenly it's like, wow. Oh. And storage, like yeah, silverfish or it. cockroaches, moths, et cetera, et cetera. There's that issue as well. Mm-hmm. I honestly don't think I'd ever do shirts again. Yeah. You, you, you need like a warehouse. Yeah, you have to really have it down. And, uh, yeah, we don't have it down. No. <laughs> but also you'll get, like, I want this, I want yeah. this, and I want this. So you do it and then you ghost it and you're like, fuck, now I've got to sell it. Like, I, I, I put so much time and effort into it. Yeah. Uh, now I hope someone buys it in that yeah. size. Yeah. It's, sure. And doing it yeah, for that price right. point. That, probably... it, it's that price point thing argument though too, right? Is that you, you can do something, mm-hmm. but people want to pay yeah. the very least they can for it as mm-hmm. well. Yeah, we have, yeah. We, have a, uh, we put up all the designs on direct because we, we use a, a uh, direct garment. Yeah. I mean, we have a uh, drop shipping on our website, so we don't have to do anything, but we make, I think we make around like $3 and 50 cents a shirt when it one yeah. sells and they're yeah. four ninety nine. Yeah. So it caught, you know, we, but we don't have to do anything. So that's the only real way we could do it unless we were to actually start hiring a company to print them. And mm-hmm. cause we'd like to do that, but it's just, we're not there yet. Just let people know like, Oh, check out the website. We yeah. don't have anything here, but you know, you can get it sent to you directly. Because they've got all the different sizes. Yeah. And the- That's the other thing about, like, the shows is when, yeah. when you're at a show and someone asks you about a shirt. They want it. Like, yeah. They're not going to go and order it later. That That's never happened. Yeah. Like, that's happened once. Yeah. Well, I have been once in text. person mm-hmm. was asking if you have a shirt. I'm like, yeah, I do. I just forgot to load it. So I upload it. And they literally went there and bought it five minutes later. So that was, like, kind of neat. But, you know. It's the only time it's, it's, the only time it's ever happened. <laughs> And, and I suppose that's the point, right? Is that you, when you factor in the time to upload those things and go down that road and do that research and all the rest of it, you wonder whether or not you're actually making money to actually do all of those things. So, you know, it's one of those one of those interesting parts to this that isn't yeah. really well talked about, I suppose, in the in the hobby. Um, My background's so. pet shop, also, and you know damn well from retail. What you think is really cool, really nice, et cetera, et cetera, that will sit on the shelf. But the ugliest ornament in the fish aisle that you think mm-hmm. is like you wouldn't be seen dead with it walks out the door, yeah. can't get more back in fast enough. And there's that as well in your own business. It's so hard. Like you're, you've done something, you're super proud of it. It's not commonly, you know, in other artworks or whatnot. And it might not sell. Mm-hmm. Whereas other stuff walks out the door and you, you're sort of flabbergasted that that particular piece isn't doing like you thought it would. Yeah, it's definitely trends. And um, what's interesting too is is regionally, people are all looking for different things here in the U.S. So the first time I went to Florida, I constantly was asked the entire, throughout the entire show, do you have any alligator prints? No. Do you have any sea turtles? No. Do you have any (laughs) tanks? No. I had... I had like so retic stickers with me, and you can't keep retics down there. Like I, I, I just had a. I, I needed to pay attention to my audience in a different state to see what they were looking for. I didn't think about that because up north we keep turtles up here because they're maintenance, and you can't keep them outside. And so it's just not really a thing. You've got red-eared spiders. Some people have a red foot, or maybe a Russian, and like that's it. Um, so going on to Florida, there's all these different tourist vendors. Now it's like completely new to me. So it's been interesting seeing regionally what people are looking for. So they're looking for Texas critters. So that's definitely been, been interesting. But yeah, some of the stuff that I'm like super proud of or that I'm into necessarily what everybody else is jazzed about. So but it's also definitely like interesting. 
it's also your train of thought. Like I think that, okay, for us with the bookshop, say you'd have, say, husbandry books on Australian animals, but also mm-hmm. traveling and things like that because of current economic climate at the moment is a luxury. So are books and artwork and whatnot, I'm guessing. But to me, it's mm-hmm. like you could learn, you could see, you could, you know, plot out a bucket list or whatever. But other people don't think like that. It's it's hard to gauge yeah. it. Yeah, it's interesting to see what what trends are, what people are doing. It's not, not always what we think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I suppose you know, sort of, if you if you had to give some advice, right, to a budding artist. Right, there's wanting to break in to, you know, they want to be your competition essentially at some point in time or maybe not wanting to, to sell or something like that. They just want to become a better artist. What's, what's your advice to them? The, the biggest, biggest thing, the biggest takeaway in my opinion is to use each piece that you critique and that you're not happy with as a learning point. So I get this constantly at shows. People, oh, I used to draw, but I'm not any good at it. So I st- the only way to get better is to keep at it. Don't. And it's really <laughs> kind of a big thing. I think a lot of people, they get discouraged. They compare, to somebody, compare themselves to somebody that's been doing it for 20, 30 years and are frustrated that they're not at that level. And then they stop because they're happy with what they're creating. They're, they're really comparing themselves to somebody that's been doing it for a decade or several decades. Everybody starts somewhere. All the best artists started somewhere. So I think it's important to look at each piece. You may not be happy with it, but what can you learn from it to use in the next one? I can almost critique every piece of mine. I can point out something that I would change. There's always going to be something that I'd do differently next time. That's just how it is, and that's how you, how you get better. Um, but you can't let that completely stop you or let your let your whole self worth down because of that so that's it's literally it's a good thing that you're able to see that because that that means you can continue to get better and continue to challenge yourself um one thing that i heard somebody say was the better you get the better your standards get and it's 100 percent true with any type of creativity you know the the better you get the more you want to strive for and um i think the the key is not to let that get in your head and tell you you're not good enough it's the opposite so that's just kind of the the biggest thing i would i would tell folks is don't give up if you're upset with it learn from it and keep going how long have you been drawing what is it a natural skill for you or did you have to learn it like you're amazing i can't actually think that you would have to learn that like a little bit of both so i mean there's natural aptitudes to things but like any profession like a plumber or a mechanic or anybody else you know, someone might be a little bit more mechanically inclined, but they still have to learn how to, you know, rebuild an engine. They, it's it's a skill that won't get you anywhere if you don't develop. Um, you can still stay at that basic level, which will stay good, but not necessarily great. So I've always been drawing. I've been drawing since I was little, since I can really remember. And I did it in high school. I was very active in all my arts classes and friends with all my art teachers and did a lot. And then pretty much as soon as I graduated, I, I stopped for the most part. Uh, I was just so busy working. I, I work, I've worked with animals my entire life. I'm very grateful that I've been in the animal industry, uh, working at pet stores in the wild center and working at the aquatic store. So I've always, always had that going on. And we draw like once or twice a year. I like make a fun drawing for a friend or, you know, something like that. But I didn't actually pick it back up until a little bit in 2018. Then at the end of 2019 is when I started creating more. And, you know, I stopped for like, what, eight years ago. But when I got back into it, I was at my high school level. Yeah. But I was able to see things that I couldn't see when I was in high school. I was able to kind of take a step back and judge my work a little bit better. But my skills were still where I left off. Yeah, you're able to look at it without the high school emotion. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I wasn't emotionally attached to it. I wasn't, you know, um, letting anything get to me if it was a piece that I wasn't really happy with. So I, I literally, I, I said, I left off high school level and the key is to keep going with it. And so 
2018, I joined the Inktober Challenge. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's a prompt list for every day in October. There's random words. Oh, yeah. It'll be like strength or it'll be, you know, uh, hidden or, you know, it'll be literally a random word. And usually people do all kinds of cool, fantastical things. And me, I did animals. And I didn't have a lot of time. So I did one inch by one inch squares. Little, little itty bitty oh, cool. squares. That I because I just didn't have a whole lot of time to be able to dedicate to it. And once I started doing those and I'm posting them online, a friend of ours is like, Hey, do you have an art page? I was like, No, weirdo. (laughs) 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 Why would anybody want to see my art? That's silly. And uh, so I I was like, Yeah, screw it, why not? And so I made an art page and started sharing them there. And just through friends I made in the industry, that were keeping animals, they, you know, saw those little, little line drawings were like, Hey, that's pretty cool. You know, can you draw? Why not? Like that sounds fun. So I started doing some portraits. Uh, next thing I know, I'm getting asked to do a couple of logos. I'm like, yeah, I can do a logo for sure. And it literally just snowballed into me working till, you know, two or three in the morning after I'd get home from work and <laughs> dedicating all of my free time to be able to make cool artwork and try to try to continue to better myself. So I ended up, I quit job in full time with the artwork in February of 2020 and pretty much have been doing that since. I'm still trying to push myself over peace. Um, I I have some, some pretty high goals I want to meet and it'll take a while for me to get there, but I know I'll, I'll get there eventually. Have you tried using digital mediums like the tablets and uh, like Apple pencils and stuff like that and done that digital sort of things? I know you use, I think you are saying before, the coupling markers and pencil and stuff like that as your main primary stuff, but have you mm-hmm. tried digital sort of things or you don't quite like the, the digital I medium do. yet? I do. I've actually been working with digital for, for a long while now. Uh, when I first started, I was actually doing um, digital drawing in a traditional style and thought that was kind of the route that I was going to end up going, but I I actually prefer traditional medium. So I still use it for logos and I'll still use it for sticker designs or like fun graphic design things that I need to do. But when it comes to working on a realistic piece, the problem with digital, and I was just talking to an art friend about this that is experiencing the same thing with his sketches is you can infinitely zoom in. And so I thought, you know, Oh, I'm going to make myself a new photo. And this was in 2020 when I had just gotten a tablet and Apple. I was excited. I'm going to make myself, I'm going to do a tree on there with his mouth open. It's I'm, I'm making him super realistic. Next thing I know, I'm over 20 hours in (laughs) the top of mouth is done. (laughs) And it's great. If you zoom into it, but I spent so much time yeah. on this thing because I could continually zoom into it and I was perfecting it so much that I literally wasted an entire 24 hours on just the top of its head. And, <laughs> you know, that was tired of it. And so I'm like, I'm going to set this aside and back to it later. She never did. It never did. And then by the time I did come <laughs> around to it, I was I don't like this anymore. I'm done. <laughs> so <laughs> that all that time went down the drain. Um, but yeah, so I I, I, I suppose I can... the... oh go ahead. So I'm a left hander, right? So you know I you know sort of draw and draw and wrote and draw like most conventional people, I suppose, from left to right. And so this part of the hand then goes across the ink, and mm-hmm. then completely covers things. So um. When I was, I used to try and do some light drawing, um, line drawings and stuff like that when I've done line drawings and things like that. To do those, and then you end up smudging them as you go through, and it's like, okay, no, I'm never going to do that again. And so then I had a crack on the tablet that Ty's got with the Apple Pencil and all the rest of it. Oh mm-hmm. my god, it's so amazing! Much easier. And you don't get the smudge, um, which was great, but. You know, at the same time, it's like, uh, I don't like using tablets and all the rest of it. I find it much more enjoyable to try and do it with 
a pen and paper as opposed to um, as opposed to that. Yeah. Um, I, I think sketching, sketching out ideas and rounding them out traditionally, like with pencil and paper is, um, you know, even, even now, even with all the tablets, I'll still kind of get that idea traditionally. And then I'll do the finished product on the tablet. Um, drawing on it's fun. I just, I, I'm way too, way too angry. <laughs> to be able to, um, you know, I, I get way into the details. So the, the traditional medium, it gives me a physical like stopping point uh, of how small I can actually go or how detailed I can actually get. And I think people appreciate traditional a little bit more than they appreciate digital, which it's the same method. It's the same. You're literally doing the ex- pretty much the exact same thing. You've got more tools and you can space and uh you can layer things which is awesome but it's still the same method but people don't always realize that and so i know yeah, sure. digital art kind of first came about a lot of people look down their nose at it thinking that oh the computer's making it for you but it's not um but you know i've been able to see a piece done in a traditional form with the tools that are you know that are there to to create it kind of lights that interest in people a little bit more than seeing uh, a digital drawing of an animal, you know, without any medium around it or n- without knowing what it's from. So that's, that's part of the reason why I ended up going over to traditional. It's, it's just fun. I, I really enjoy, I, I find it a neat challenge because, you know, I can, I can flub some areas up, but I can't mess it up too bad or I may not be able to go back. And so I think having that, that little edge is kind of fun for me to try to make sure I get crisp or as, as um, nice as possible. Yeah, I'm quite bad. So I'm all about the being able to remove the mistakes with ease. Procreate. It's the best thing it, ever. <laughs> it really is. I, I love procreate. I, I use it so much and it's, it's awesome. But yeah. When, when I first started digital drawing, I didn't have an iPad or anything yet. I had one of those like tablets. The wake up it wasn't out. The and so I was used to Wacom? Yeah, the, yeah. yeah. How hard is that to use compared to the tablet? Like the Apple. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> I used that for years too. I used it for a long time. And I used to hit um what is it, Command Z or like the backspace all the time. And I would find myself when I would draw traditionally, I would tap my fingers like I was tapping the keyboard <laughs> in hopes to do stuff when I couldn't undo it. Idiot. <laughs> Stupid. Oh, that's what you get used to. <laughs> yeah, control Z in real life doesn't really work too well, does it? No, it doesn't. Um, I wish it did. Yes and no. I mean, making mistakes is half the fun, isn't it? Oh, that's true. And you learn from them too. I mean, that, 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 you know, a mistake is an experience that, you know, the way you could phrase it or frame it, I suppose, and the way I try to frame it is a mistake is an experience you learn yeah. from. You know, for me, it would be more like that. Like, it's just no longer a mistake, then it's, it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's just another experience. Not necessarily a good one, but an experience nonetheless. <laughs> so, are you guys um, introverts or extroverts? When you're at a show and whatnot, do you find it easy or do you sort of. I feel like we're both. We're happy medium. Yeah. So it depends we, on the show. Yeah, it depends on the show. It depends on what we got going on, how stressed we are. But usually, for the most part, we get really excited yeah. at the shows because we get to see everybody and we get to chat and like we're on that adrenaline rush of you know getting the show set up, getting everything ready, saying hi to everybody, and it's so fun catching up with everybody. Then after the show, we crash. <laughs> <laughs> People that we don't are, bend don't realize how exhausting it is. Like you may only be standing yeah. there or sitting there, but to all your stock prices, people probably ask you how you, how you come about it, rah, rah, rah. And then there's the wow. reptile side yeah. of it. Yeah, yeah. it is. It knackers you. It's there's a lot of it. Usually the picture will like, gone we're like don't there's talk to bands, us there's been shows where we didn't even unload the van for like two weeks yeah yeah sometimes especially if it's a long drive and we have to get home right I'll away just leave it in there it'll figure itself out 
Yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, yeah, so usually after the show, we're a bit tired. We want to sleep. We want to catch up on our on our rest. But, you know, we get really excited to be able to go to all the shows. I'm, it's always a, a good experience. But, yeah, you say a, a good dose of both. Wait till you hit our age. <laughs> <laughs> when we're outside of shows though i would say we're both pretty not necessarily introverted you like your boring. own <laughs> we don't really do out much we don't do, do anything lot. yeah uh, um we I'll, don't go to the bars we don't we don't really i've got D D. we've got D D that we do so that's like our social time um I like to be at the barn riding and outside of that, we don't really do a whole lot. We're not very exciting. I think people think that maybe we're really exciting because we're, <laughs> we can be fun, happy at the shows, but we're, we're very boring people. <laughs> uh, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I was speaking to a girlfriend yesterday afternoon on you guys saying that you leave everything in the van for a while and they just did a reptile expo in New South Wales. And they were like, I'm not fucking unpacking everything. So they left a big bit of acrylic in the car that they had were going to use the next day. He goes, it was 42 degrees and the fucking thing was a wave when we went in there in the morning. So we had to rush out to the hardware shop and buy more acrylic. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. Not... yeah. Food in It's not good. Not good well, just... food. We didn't really <laughs> unpack. What's that? I'm sorry. You know, oh, I was just going to say, I'm, we unloaded all our stuff, but there was still a lot of crap in the bed. Dang it, no. And I was grabbing stuff, and you had your protein drink and one of those oh, cups no. in my hand. I lifted it up. I was like, what is in here? I opened it. And it's all I was like, son of a bitch. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, Sorry. Bandit, something, but it was just like, protein shit yeah. stink. <laughs> <laughs> could be what could be protein farts. Um, yeah, yeah. You know. <laughs> how is how expensive is it to to vend shows over there? Is it is it expensive to to vend over there and all the rest? Of um, it? The big ones are going to be more than the smaller ones. Uh, Tinley, I think like three sixty, yeah, three eighty something. Three eighty a table, roughly, and I think we have two tables there. Some shows shows like a hundred and fifty dollars a table. And we'll get four tables, but they're thousand miles away. Yeah, Daytona's so, three hundred table. You know, that's now uh, trying to think. That's twenty five hour, twenty two hours of driving each way, thousand yeah. miles. So it ends up breaking down to like six hundred dollars just yeah. fuel getting back. So yeah. then when you have hotels and everything involved, some of these shows are two thousand dollars and for you can have for sale. So, I think too mm-hmm. that you know that's something to to consider. Like for the people that are getting into to doing some of this sort of stuff, like whether you are you selling artwork or you're selling books or, or any of those mm-hmm. things or, or, or goods, you know, people don't necessarily see that it. They see the price tags and they go, "Oh, you know, that seems expensive and all the rest of it." They mis misunderstand that. This show has cost you two thousand, three thousand, four thousand dollars to do. So by the time you go there, you know, go there, do the stuff that you need, get the equipment, and then uh, feed yourself and have a place to sleep, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, those people aren't tending to do those things either, and it's it's an interesting sort of part of it. That's for sure. And you're also not yeah, drawing, does... so you're taking away from more artwork that you could be making as well. Yep. While you are and working. You know. Sorry, the lag's terrible, okay. isn't it? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, it's, it's legitimately as us. Eh? I can see the quality is going up, and you guys are there, we're up shit creek at the moment. So it's, yeah, it's all us. Yeah, I think we'll just have to like know when we're done speaking a couple seconds and see who speaks next. <laughs> <laughs> done. <laughs> Oh, now there's a dead Blaming silence her. everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, the work, it, it, it's just to get ready for shows. People don't realize how much work it is prepping, even just prints. 
because we back and sleeve everything. So yes. I have to create an original piece, which takes time. I, it takes a long time to prepare it. it takes a long and time to do 10 it. Ten to twenty hours in a piece, or usually. Once I finish the piece, I send it to him. He photographs it. It takes him sometimes just as much time to cut it out. There was one that took me, I, I don't know why, it took me forever. It took me like seven hours yeah. to cut it out because the That's paper okay. and the lighting was horrible. We didn't have a studio lighting, so we were using daylight lighting. So I was shooting it, but the paper was just as detailed as the, the original, the, the artwork. So you couldn't auto-select anything. So you had to go in there and Photoshop and around every leaf, every single bubble of every scale on the edge. And I was just thinking, I hate this woman. Yeah. I yeah. I'm too scared to hit. Yeah. <laughs> I'm too scared to hit the auto select because I've done it a few times and I've been that focused on this end. I haven't noticed that it's cut out a bit this end, and then I have to. And I'm really bad with layers. I forget to add layers, so then I have to start again. So I do everything from scratch. And I've got to admit, I cut out an emerald tree monitor mm -hmm. that Scott had taken a photograph on a tree, and oh my fucking god, I hated that because obviously there's green leaves. It's a green <laughs> lizard, and oh, that took forever. Hard to do. If you zoom in too much, you forget where you're at. Yep. And you'll actually cut out like half the animal. You'll fall. You'll just follow a scale pattern, and the other part of the animal will be the same colors of paper. Kind of. like, like, yeah, so you're not paying attention. Next thing you know, you just cut a lot or something. And I'm like, okay, that's happened a couple times, but luckily I can just go back. But it's like the time Maybe wasted doing that. Yeah. You know, you get mad, or if you push the the words when you, yeah, I always have my hand sitting over the keyboard, and I've accidentally hit escape while I was cutting. And it's deleted everything I just did for 15, 20 minutes. Is that when so, I hear you swearing yeah, in the other room? probably. <laughs> so. Yeah. I feel your pain. All that is that done. With, yeah. I feel your pain doing it with the distribution map for the books. So the way we do the distribution maps yeah. is that we've got the, um, we have in Photoshop, I've got four different layers of maps of Australia. So I've got one that's got a layer of the outline. It's got the states as a different as a different layer. It's got the sea as one layer, and then Australia all completely filled in that layer. And then what I do mm -hmm. when I'm going to do the distribution map, I erase the color out of it, right? Of so you layer. know which section it is. Yeah. So then when so then when you right. and then so. And so what I've done twice now, and I've learnt by this, so now I've got three master copies saved, is I've hit save on the master copy. Yeah. There's no way of getting it back once you've deleted all that stuff off. And like I said before, how you zoom right in, you're zooming right in to do that cutter or put that put that ink into the, uh, into the image, and you just burn through yeah. hours of time. Um, so twice now. That's when you just get up and walk away. Yeah. I saw yeah. Paddy yeah. before getting up and walking away, but I do get up and walk away. <laughs> it's, yeah. Sure. Yeah. I'll crack on again. Um, I, I suppose, you know, we're getting to about the 95 minute mark. Um, and we sort of cognate the time we want to keep you guys sort of here all, all evening, all morning for us, you know. Um, you know, what, is there anything that you guys like to chat about uh, before we get on to our final final few questions? Um, I'm oh. just really, really excited for all of our coming adventures and ventures. <laughs> the the Patreon's going to be a lot of fun because I've been, I've been asked a lot about, you know, how I do what I do in the process of it. And I think it'll be a really good way for people to be able to see, you know, from start to finish how I do my pieces where it is explained and I love people to want to learn to, to start getting into it too. You know, I, I love encouraging other artists and I love encouraging people that want to be creative, no matter what type of medium or whatever they want to create. And so I really hope that it'll be, be a help to that budding artist or that budding, you know, Herper that wants to, wants to get into it and uh, can just information that might be able to help them be able to, to pursue it as well. So that's what I'm mostly, mostly excited about right now. Yeah. You guys seem to have a really good presence on social media. Um, is that something that you learnt or is that something you've just always been fairly adept at? Or is it, you know, experience and I'll buy it, I suppose. I think it's more, more trial and error. 
uh, when it first started, I think I started at a, a decent time to start. It was because I, I went full time February of 2020, right before everything got shut down. And so as you know, disheartening as that was, because now all of the shows that I planned for are canceled. I have no money because I spent all of my money on stuff for shows. You know, I just started and it's shut down already. But what I did was I started doing live videos daily of tiny canvases that I would paint animals on. And I would just go on Facebook Live. So, you know, folks at home that didn't have somebody to hang out with or people that, you know, just really wanted something to do or something to watch or they just wanted to hang and chat, they'd be able to. And so I started doing those every single day. And that helped quite a bit. I would share them, share stuff in groups. And slowly, more and more people started learning about it and tuning in and watching the lives. And then, you know, from there, it kind of kicked off and I just try to post consistently. And I love I love engaging with people. I love meeting people. And I think that's been a, a really big help. In it. And now getting out to the shows, that helps a lot. You know, you get a lot of people coming through that you get to meet. So um, it kind of happened organically and it happened all by fire, but... Um, I do try to put some effort into to post some cool stuff that people might enjoy. What's the one takeaway that you want the listeners to get from this episode? I'd love for people to embrace their creativity and not limit themselves based on how they think they're doing in comparison to others. You know, use people people's artwork that you enjoy as inspiration, as something to strive to, not something to compare to. That's awesome. And really where can well. our listeners find you? My website is AdelineRobinsonArt.com. I've got all my social media links on there. And I'll hopefully be updating my YouTube soon. But uh, pretty much everything can be from there, from merch and apparel, artwork, to, you know, commission logo information as well. Well, we'll make sure we have that in show notes as well. So when that comes out, we'll make sure that all that information's in there for you. Okay, so... the. The last question that we've got, and this is the sort of question that we've been asking everybody, um, is, you know, somewhat negative, I suppose, a little bit at a point. Um, how do you tackle or deal with the sort of misogyny in the in the reptile industry and the, in the herp industry? So something that I've noticed is how much things have changed in the last yeah. 10, 15 years that I've been in it. When I first started... Um, there were a lot of people very confused that I, as a woman was into reptiles to begin and then two that I had experience with them. And so, you know, we'd, I'd have guys come to the pet store telling me that they had a 13 foot Brazilian rainbow boa. They were trying to impress me, you know, <laughs> with, I'm like, yeah, yeah. no, no, yeah. You're, you're just, it's all right, buddy. You know, oh, well, I have brony. Have you ever gone? Yeah, we bred them here. We have several brony here. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I, I did, I have dealt with it and I have dealt with it a lot in the past, but I've noticed in the last 10 to 15 years, there's been a wonderful shift. There's been a lot more women in the community. I think a lot more women feel more accepted and more understood, especially with just there being more women in the hobby now. There's a lot of really awesome groups that, you know, help uplift others and um i've noticed that a lot of things have changed so i can't honestly remember the last time i have dealt with any of it personally but in my experience i just smile and nod and continue talking about whatever i'm talking about i can just be myself so if, if somebody wants to try to join up me or try to you know downplay what i know that's that's and that's not on me yeah. and um you know not happen very often anymore. So I think as just as more women have gotten into the hobby, it's become more normalized. So there's you know so many amazing people out there with so much knowledge. I think it's uh, unfair to judge anybody what they might look like or who they might be, you know, in terms of what they yeah, might the, know. The stereotype, the stereotype that a herper is this guy who's got tattoos and a beard and all that sort of stuff is so far wrong these days, which is so good to mm-hmm. see. Yeah, there's there's a little bit of everybody enjoying. That's that's how it should be, you know. Everybody be able to enjoy reptiles, and it's awesome to be able to see that. And the, I think the online community can be very toxic in many groups, but when you actually come out to the shows for folks that haven't ever been to it, just are online, they might see it as a big negative thing, and 
you know, when you come to the shows, there's so much camaraderie. So many people are excited to meet each other. You get so many stories. It's, it's just an amazing way to meet other people that are just as passionate about animals as you are. And, you know, that, that unites all of us, you know, there, there aren't that many differences between us when we're all geeking out about, you know, these different creatures and, you know, it also gives a fun opportunity to learn about each other and different different things that we're into. Because there's a lot of hobby crossover, too. A lot of people that, you know, are into reptiles or into horses. And I did a group for reptile horse girls to that go out herping when they go out. So there's, there's a lot of really fun ways to network and meet people. So I you know, just think that's awesome. And I, I hope it continues and keeps getting better. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that. Thanks for listening to the Cold Bladder Contributions podcast. A massive thank you to our guests, Adeline and Chris. We appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to talk to us. And with such short notice, guys, thank you so much. <laughs> we, will, we will be releasing our podcast monthly, so make sure you hit the subscribe. And don't forget to check out all the other podcasts in the Morelia Python Radio Network. www.moreliapythonradio.net is where you can find us, Morelia Python Radio, Carpets and Coffee, Reptile Fight Club, Boas, 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 Colubrid and Colubroid Radio, the Australian Herpet Culture Podcast, and the Monitor Keeping Podcast. Give the Cold Blooded Contributions Podcast a like on Facebook so you don't miss any updates, giveaways, or guest announcements. The links discussed in today's podcast will be in the show notes. And always remember to trust your creativity, it's intelligence having fun.